Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 8869 in the name of Jenny Minto on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I would invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. And I call on Jenny Minto to speak to and move the, the motion. Minister, around 10 minutes, please. Presiding officer. I am pleased to be opening this debate on the general principles of the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill, which will establish an independent public advocate focused on ensuring patients' voices are heard. We know from the testimony of countless patients gathered by Baroness Cumberledge in the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review that too often patients, their families and members of the public do not feel listened to when they raise concerns about the safety of healthcare. As a result, they doubt that their feedback will lead to change and their relationship with healthcare providers may break down, causing them to lose trust in the healthcare system and at worst, as the, as the cases highlighted by Baroness Cumberledge so starkly demonstrate, this can lead to patients suffering serious avoidable harm. We need to address this. Good healthcare is a fundamental right for everyone. It is essential that patients have confidence that every time they access part of the healthcare system, not only will they receive the best available treatment without fear of harm, but also that any concerns they raise will be listened to. A culture of openness and learning enables everyone to feel able to share what has gone well, but also what has gone wrong or could have gone better. We must ensure that learning and improvement does happen when things go wrong to continue to make healthcare better. In her report, Baroness Cumberledge recommended the appointment of a patient sa safety commissioner who would be an independent public leader with a statutory responsibility. The commissioner would champion the value of listening to patients and promoting users' perspectives in seeking improvements to patient safety around the use of medicines and medical devices. This bill will create a patient safety commissioner who will be directly accessible to patients, their families, and members of the public to hear their concerns, bringing their stories together with quantitative safety data from across the healthcare system to spot trends and make healthcare safer for us all. They will be independent of the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland, allowing them to challenge the healthcare system, and they will be free to consider any issue pertaining to the safety of patients in healthcare settings throughout Scotland. I believe this bill demonstrates that we have taken Baroness Cumberledge's work and the views of patients seriously. The, this Commissioner's remit is wider than Baroness Cumberledge recommended. It will not be restricted to the consideration of medicines and medical devices, but will be able to look at patient safety more widely. This is because patients have told us there is a potential for harm in many other areas of healthcare and we want the Commissioner to be able to look at the things that patients tell them are important. I am very grateful to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for its support for the general principles of the Bill and to committee members for their detailed and careful consideration of the issues. I'd like to thank my predecessor Minister, uh, as Minister for Public Health and Women's Health, Marie Todd, for her leadership of the Bill. Most importantly, I would also like to thank the various people and organisations who have participated by giving evidence on the Bill since it was introduced, including the patients and family members who showed great courage in telling their stories once again and in advocating tenaciously for the creation of this post. This was very powerful evidence. I am pleased the Committee has agreed to the general principles of the Bill while recognising they have requested further clarity and changes in some areas. The Government recognises the importance of listening to a wide variety of views to ensure that the Patient Safety Commissioner role, once created, is as effective as possible in being able to freely and independently advocate for the views and interests of patients to improve the safety of care. It is particularly encouraging that the Committee has backed the general principles of the Bill unanimously and that they reported strong support for this role from the patients and patient representatives they heard from. The committee emphasised the importance of ensuring the patient safety commissioner's role is clearly defined and that the commissioner help foster a culture of openness, learning and collaboration. 
I'm also pleased that the committee recognises how vital it is that the Patient Safety Commissioner role is underpinned by robust powers that allow the Commissioner to find out what has gone on, make meaningful recommendations to improve patient safety, and then work with other organisations to achieve positive change. The committee has asked for further clarity on how the Commissioner's formal investigations work and in particular on the collaborative approach we expect the Patient Safety Commissioner to take when engaging with other organisations. That element of collaboration in the Commissioner's ways of working is something that will be crucial given the complexity of the patient safety landscape and that's something that Baroness Cummerledge also emphasised in her findings and I agree it is important we get this right. There will be instances where it is important that the Commissioner is able to share confidential information obtained in the course of their investigations with certain other bodies to enable them to exercise their statutory functions. The Bill seeks to strike a balance between enabling this while also encouraging a broad approach of collaboration, openness and learning, rather than taking a punitive approach. I agree with the Committee about the importance of the Commissioner being able to hear the views of staff where this supports the overall purpose of amplifying the patient voice. It is important that the Commissioner functions as a listening ear in the whole health care system. I have asked my officials to explore how this can be clarified at stage two. The committee has also emphasised how important it is that the Commissioner carries out thorough and meaningful consulta consultation during the development of their principles and strategic plan, particularly with those they seek to represent, the patients. And I agree that this will be key. This Parliament will also have a crucial role. Patients and the public have made it very clear that they want someone else other than government to scrutinise what is going on in the healthcare system. The Patient Safety Commissioner's freedom to determine their own priorities, informed at all times by the views of patients, and the Office's distinctive distinctness from other parts of the safety system in reporting directly to Parliament, and therefore the people of Scotland will help maintain trust in the role. It is clear from the Stage 1 report that the Committee's view is that the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland will make the views of patients heard, ensure learning and improvement when things go wrong, and help make healthcare in Scotland safer for us all. In reaching this milestone in the development of the Bill, I would like to thank those patients and families who have helped us to shape the draft legislation. They have taken time to tell us their stories and share their experiences. We have listened and I hope reflected their concerns in the draft bill that we debate here today. I would also like to thank the many other people and organisations who along with patients worked with us on the consultation and bill advisory groups, sharing their expertise and collaborating in just the way we hope they will with the Patient Safety Commissioner to help foster a culture of learning and improvement. I look forward to listening closely to members' views and, to the and, and also to the opportunity to engage with them on the bill. I again thank the committee from it, for its work during stage one and in the weeks to come. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call Claire Hawhey on behalf of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. Uh, Ms Hawhey, around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I begin, I refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest. I'm a registered mental health nurse with current NMC registration. In September 2020, we as a Parliament debated the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review, the Cumberledge Review. And the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Jean Freeman, set out how its recommendations would be implemented in Scotland. These included establishing a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland. As the convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I am pleased to speak today to our Stage 1 report on the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. The committee unanimously supports this bill, and we believe this role has the potential to improve patient safety across healthcare services in Scotland. I wasn't the convener of the committee as it took evidence on the bill, so firstly I'd like to thank Gillian Martin for her leadership during scrutiny of the bill. 
And I'd like to record our thanks to the committee clerks, the Scottish Parliament Information Centre researchers, and everyone else who has supported the committee's work on the bill so far. I'd also like to take a moment to reflect on the evidence provided by those who engaged with the committee before commenting on the committee's recommendations. I thank all of those who assisted the committee with its scrutiny, those who responded to our calls for evidence and those who gave evidence in person or online. And I would particularly like to thank Charlie Bethune, Marie Lyon, Fraser Morton and Bill Wright, who spoke to the committee about their personal experiences of serious patient safety issues. They told us that their voices were repeatedly ignored by a system that was meant to provide care and support for them and their families, and by those who were meant to regulate that system. They told us that their fights were not over, their issues still not resolved, some still not resolved after more than 70 years. And they told us about investigations that are still needed and support that's still required. In some cases, there has been no resolution. Grief has been compounded by the way that they've been treated and families have had no closure. We are grateful for their testimony to the committee. We know how difficult it must be to keep recounting their experiences. And I want to com commend their passionate campaigns on behalf of others in similar situations who don't have that opportunity or voice. Their experiences emphasise the vital role a patient safety commissioner can play. A patient safety commissioner can't change what they've been through, but it could make a real difference to how cases like theirs are managed in the future, providing a voice for those patients and their families and championing their causes. Looking forward, the commissioner could use these powers to try to make sure no one else has the same experiences. And crucially, it could ensure lessons are learned and other such incidents are prevented from happening in the future, as well as identifying patient safety issues that require investigation, but that the system is not yet aware of. Our report concentrates on areas where the committee thinks that the bill, as it's currently drafted, might need to be clarified to make sure it can achieve these outcomes. The committee supports widening the remit of the role beyond medicines and medical devices to include patient safety more broadly. And while the committee recognises the complex systems related to patient safety, governance and regulation already in place in Scotland, we believe the voice of patients is missing from those systems. The Commissioner can fill that gap, amplifying the voices of patients and advocating for systemic improvements that draw on patient experiences. The Committee welcomes the independence of the role as set out in the Bill and endorses proposals that the Commissioner should have the freedom to define and establish the principles that will underpin their work and the remit and scope of that work. And we believe patients should be given an opportunity to provide input into the process of establishing the Office of Commissioner and informing its strategic direction. This will ensure patients' concerns are addressed and their voices heard as the Commissioner embarks on their important work. During its scrutiny, the Committee heard a range of views about the scope of the Commissioner's role, some arguing this was too wide and others arguing it did not go far enough. Issues were raised about how safety concerns in social work would be dealt with, especially given that, as one witness noticed, people do not experience primary care, secondary care, social care or nursing care. They experience care. Some also suggested the Commissioner should additionally have a role in taking on individual cases. On the whole, the Committee believes the Bill strikes the right balance by defining a remit that is broad but manageable. However, we would like the Scottish Government to confirm that the Commissioner would be empowered to investigate, to make recommendations and to act as the voice of patients with respect to issues that intersect with or transcend health and social care. While not wanting to interfere with the Commissioner's independence, the Committee calls for a commitment that the principles underpinning the work of the Patient Safety Commissioner will include an explicit commitment to listen to and support underrepresented voices. The committee particularly believes that this is important given the specific patient safety issues that gave rise to the Cumberland Review and the circumstances of those affected by them, notably women. 
The committee considers it is vital that the Commissioner has the necessary capabilities to compel capabilities to compel evidence from all organisations involved in providing health care, including private companies who supply medicines and medical devices. It should also have the power to follow up on the implementation of its recommendations. It's of paramount importance that there is public confidence in the role of the Commissioner. Given the patient experiences highlighted by the Cumberland Review, with many feeling that they were not listened to and frustrated by the length of time taken for their problems to be acknowledged, work will need to be done to raise public awareness of this new role, but equally to manage expectations. Crucially, the role will need to be sufficiently resourced to fulfil its functions. The committee recommends robust monitoring and evaluation to ensure patients' voices are effectively amplified through the work of the Patient Safety Commissioner and that there is ongoing public confidence in the role and in the wider system for reviewing and addressing patient safety issues. In conclusion, then, Presiding Officer, the committee is content to support the general principles of the Bill and considers it is a crucial addition to the patient safety landscape in Scotland that should help to ensure patients' voices are consistently heard and acted upon. I'm grateful to the Minister for having provided such a quick response to the Committee's Stage 1 report. I set out in that response. We look forward to seeing further improvements to the Bill at Stage 2, reflecting our key recommendations. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Hawking. And I call Tess White uh, for around eight minutes. Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open this Stage 1 debate on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I pay tribute to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee clerks, our present and former conveners, and especially to the witnesses, campaigners and experts who contributed their insights and lived experience. As a starting point, we must recognise why a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland is needed. In the report of the UK-wide Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review, Baroness Cumberledge pointed to the avoidable harm that patients, mostly women, have experienced as a result of the hormone pregnant pregnancy test Primados using sodium valparate in pregnancy and pelvic mesh implants. In the report, Baroness Cumberledge described the truly heart-wrenching stories of acute suffering, families fractured, children harmed, and much else. Adverse effect of hormone pregnancy tests, including congenital anomalies and tragically miscarriage, stillbirth, and baby deaths. If taken by mothers during pregnancy, sodium valparate can cause physical and neurodevelopmental effects in children. And many MSPs in the chamber this afternoon have been contacted by mesh injured women about the life changing and distressing symptoms the surgery has caused. Alarmingly, Baroness Cumberledge found that the patient voice was dismissed, that patients blamed themselves for the harm to, for the harm to their children caused by medicines they took in good faith and that they struggled to navigate a complex healthcare landscape in order to advocate for themselves. It was against this background that Baroness Cumberledge's report called for a public spokesperson with the necessary authority and standing to talk about and report on, to influence and cajole where necessary, without fear or favour, on matters related to patient safety, which brings us to the bill we're debating today. Presiding officer, this bill is consensual. It has cross-party support. The Scottish Conservatives are pleased to support the general principles of the legislation at stage one. However, support does not mean absence of scrutiny. The role of the Patient Safety Commissioner must be an effective champion for patients, so it is vital to get the approach and the role's powers right. As the Royal College of Nursing emphasises, the views of staff on patient safety must be heard and the Commissioner must have the power to follow up on the implementation of recommendations. In her evidence, Baroness Cumberledge said that she was satisfied with the bill and agreed with all of it and that it is extremely well put together. 
she described the Patient Safety Commissioner as the golden thread running through a complex patient safety and clinical governance landscape and helping to tie it all together. The patient safety landscape is indeed saturated. Alongside regional health boards, we have the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, the NHS Incident Report Reporting and Investigation Centre, a patient advice and support service provided by Citizens Advice Scotland, professional regulatory bodies such as the General Medical Council, and legislation including the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011. And that list isn't exhaustive. The Patient Safety Commissioner can help to unify these organisations and create more coherence in a cluttered landscape. But there is also a risk of duplication. What works well on paper doesn't always work in practice, and there will need to be relationship building on both sides to effectively support and advocate for patients. I know when the former Health Secretary first announced the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland, she indicated that the role would focus on improvements to patient safety around the use of medicines and medical devices. The Scottish Government's approach has since changed considerably, however, with the bill widening the remit of the Patient Safety Commissioner to patient safety more generally. A wider remit has implications for resourcing, something the committee did explore in some depth after the Finance and Public Administration Committee raised a red flag. And, it, and they said it was an, an expensive extension to our public sector, which is a, a cause for concern. In his evidence to the committee, Dr. Gary Duncan, Chief of Staff to the Patient Safety Commissioner for England, who has a much narrower remit, emphasised that we would need expanded resources if we wanted to take on further work. And that suggests that more resources will need to be available sooner rather than later for the role in Scotland. In her evidence, the then Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport responded to resourcing concerns by pointing to the collaborative role the Commissioner is expected to adopt by working with existing patient safety bodies, organisations and regulators. This way of working, the Minister indicated, will reduce the burden of work on the PSC. However, there still is insufficient clarity around this dynamic on the face of the bill, something that does need to be addressed at stage two. It's important to get the resourcing right because there are already high expectations around what this role will achieve for patients whose voices have too often been ignored. But it's also important because public funds are being used and there should be transparency and accountability around that process from the outset. And to this end, even after the bill completes its parliamentary passage, the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee should be involved. It should be involved in oversight and monitoring of the Patient Safety Commissioner's performance. Notwithstanding these comments, Presiding Officer, it's clear there is significant support for this bill. My colleagues and I look forward to strengthening it at stage two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. White. I now call Paul Sweeney for around seven minutes. Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Labour will support the bill at stage one today as we are supportive of the general principles, albeit we do have some reservations on the detail contained in the proposed bill and will look to engage with the government on amendments before stage two. As has already been outlined, the bill seeks to establish the Office of Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland, as described in section one, and that Patient Safety Commissioner will have two primary functions. To advocate for systemic improvement in the safety of healthcare and to promote the importance of the views of patients and other members of the public in relation to the safety of healthcare. Both of these provisions are warmly welcome, and as a deputy convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, I would echo the comments of the convener, the member for Lugland, eh, to the excellent Stage 1 committee report that was published at the end of April. I'd also like to take a moment, Deputy Presiding Officer, to thank the clerks and officials for their work on that report. It's a great summary, and I'd recommend all members take some time to digest it. The bill is supported by a wide array of stakeholders, including the likes of Valparate Scotland, Haemophilia Scotland, and the Association for Children Damaged by Hormone Pregnancy Tests, 
all of whom gave evidence to the committee, and for that I am incredibly grateful. The establishment of a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland is something that is long overdue. At present, the voice of patients and NHS service users is all too often forgotten, and it frequently leads to situations where we don't learn from systemic mistakes and failures that have been made in the past and run the risk of repeating them. This is an issue that the committee highlighted in our report, and I think it's safe to say that it was a large body of concern among stakeholders that the proposed commissioner won't have the remit to investigate individual complaints, as well as the fact that there will be no locus for the commissioner on matters pertaining to systemic issues in social care. Given the inherently intertwined nature of health in the National Health Service and social care, something that the government seemingly recognise and agree with given the proposed bill uh, for the National Care Service, I do think it would be helpful for some thought to be given on how we perhaps expand, whether immediately or in the future, the role of the Commissioner to include social care. This is something that was raised by my colleague, Mr O'Kane, the Member for West Scotland in committee, and I know that the Minister disagrees with the idea of extending the remit to include social care, but we know just how complex the policy and regulatory landscape currently is, and I would hate for us to be back here again in just a few years doing something similar for social care when we could deal with it in the here and now in this bill process. As the Scottish Public Service's Ombudsman has said in their evidence to the lead committee, given the potentially seismic changes in the health and social care landscape in Scotland, it is evident to the SPSO that a legislative separation between health and social care, which is embedded in this bill, which focuses solely on health care, may be becoming outpaced by other developments. We in the Labour Party do also have some concerns around the resourcing of the Commissioner's office. Currently, we're looking at a budget of around £644,000 per annum. While I think I appreciate that it is a significant sum of money, we are talking about a role that is tasked with investigating extremely complex, deep-rooted issues. And I do worry that the role risks becoming a PR exercise rather than a substantive mechanism for delivering justice and positive outcomes for patients. I would also just like to clarify that this isn't a concern held solely by Labour. The Royal College of GPs in Scotland's Patient Forum has raised this and has emphasised the disappointment they would feel should future budgetary decisions cause the Commissioner's office to fold, suggesting instead that funding levels should be confirmed by parliamentary procedure. So I would like to see the Government give further consideration to whether such a budget is adequate and would welcome further engagement and dialogue on that particular point as we progress through the legislative process. However, on a positive note, we do agree with the government that a patient champion is required, although we may have slightly different views on exactly what that looks like in practice. We are also grateful to the government for their commitment in the committee and uh, that the commissioner should be able to hear from staff as well in relation to patient safety concerns as flagged by the Royal College of Nursing Scotland. And on a more general point, Deputy Presiding Officer, because I'm conscious of time, I want to assure the government that Labour will work with them to ensure that we end up in a place where we are all in agreement and can wave this bill through unanimously. There are plenty of policy areas where we have disagreement, but I generally don't think this has to be one of them. We are all looking for the same outcome here, to improve the voices of patients and to ensure that the systemic issues many have experienced and have been adversely affected by don't come to pass ever again. I commit myself to working constructively with the government I know I speak for my Labour colleagues when I say that they also want to work positively with the government, and we have heard from a wide variety of stakeholders that they want to do this too. So on that note, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will conclude and look forward to the Bill's progression through its subsequent stages. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr Sooney, I can advise the Chamber we've got a little bit of time in hand, so um, if anybody wants to make an intervention, um, you can take it. Safe in the knowledge you'll get your time back. And with that, I call Alex Cole-Hamilton around six minutes. Mr Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And before I start, can I express my apologies to the Chamber for uh, having to leave the debate early this afternoon for an unavoidable reason. Um, I rise to offer my support and the support of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, the, the general principles of this bill, and uh, thank the Committee for its work to this point. Presiding Officer, of the NHS, as we often rehearse, is one of the finest and best loved national treasures that these Isles have ever produced. And, uh, it emerged as a Liberal brainchild delivered by the Labour Party um, as a universal system designed 
designed to give remedy to patients in need and support the hard working staff that administer it. Presiding officer, this system is now in crisis, and we have said that many times in this chamber, but it bears repeating. Patients and staff alike are being failed routinely by this government. The NHS's most basic principle is that people can access health care at their time of need. For too many Scottish people, this principle is no longer being fulfilled. Figures from last month reveal that cancer waiting times are the worst on record for the fifth quarter in a row. Meanwhile, one in 10 people had to wait longer than eight hours to be seen in our accident and emergency departments. Our healthcare staff go above and beyond the call of duty every single day, but instability and lack of resource are having a deleterious effect on patient safety. The past decade has been mired with HealthGate scandal, and we have heard much of that in the exchanges in this chamber. There are tens of thousands of women who have been inflicted with an excruciating and debilitating, life-changing pain because of mesh implants gone wrong. There are multiple deaths, including that of two children linked to sanitation problems at the flagship Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. There are only two of the multi these are only two of the multiple scandals Scottish healthcare has faced in recent times. Presiding officer, it is clear that structural change is required, including safeguards that ensure patient safety. And there is an urgent need for a powerful independent figure, a canary in the mind, if you like, that champions the rights of patients and secures improvements and treatments. The establishment of a patient safety commissioner in Scotland could aid the course of such a change. And whilst the Scottish Liberal Democrats have been calling for this creation of this position for over three years now, there are several concerning elements regarding the road to its delivery. Scotland was the first nation to start talking about a patient safety commissioner in the whole of these islands. However, in dithering and delay, that has become characteristic of this SMB Green Government. We are still only in the early stages of its inception. Meanwhile, England has not only had a patient uh, com safety commissioner appointed, they've been in post for over eight months now. That delay is causing real harm, and this was evidenced by an excellent article written by Marion Scott of the Sunday Post. She spoke to uh, Victoria from Ayrshire, a woman whose three-year-old tragically died at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Victoria said, one of the promises I held on to was that the government would be appointing a commissioner to do everything possible to prevent future health scandals. But here we are. Nobody has been appointed, and I feel betrayed all over again. Presiding officer, I'm sure there are many people across Scotland, like Victoria, who feel similarly let down. Furthermore, the Patient Safety Commissioner is a post that is designed to listen to the invaluable insights that patients uh, have of our NHS and thus a platform for their voices. It is somewhat confusing, therefore, as others have said, that such a commissioner is expected to amplify the concerns of those patients if they're not given the ability to directly uh, listen to them on an individual basis. It's worth noting those concerns from stakeholders that, as currently proposed, patient safety commissioner would not be able to listen to individual complaints. Elaine Holmes, the founder of Scottish Mesh Survivors, uh, expressed that this barrier to patient access in her words, flies in the face of everything a patient safety commissioner should be. It is vital that lived experience is at the heart of the patient safety commissioner's job and their mission. And patients having clear access to the position is fundamental, fundamental. And I should remind the chamber that there is precedent for this, that we empowered Scotland's commissioner for children and young people to listen directly to individual voices and take up individual cases through investigative powers. Presiding officer, we must also remember the key role that our NHS staff play in ensuring that patient welfare. With their expertise and their experience, our staff are often best placed to identify when there are problems within patient care. Despite this, in their latest report, the RCN noted that members do not always feel listened to when they raise concerns regarding the well-being of their patients. I will. Gillian Mackay. Thanks. To the member for, for taking an intervention. Would he also acknowledge that the work of the Patient Safety Commissioner should not only be seen as a stick, but also seen as a learning opportunity for both staff and for wider um, health boards to change policy and go forward in a positive manner? Alex Cole Hamilton. 
I absolutely agree with the intervention of Gillian Mackay there. Of course, I mean, there should be uh, investigative powers, but there so too should be an oppor uh, opportunity for them to disseminate best practice, to help bring uh, best practice to the fore and celebrate success in our health service as well. And staff too should have the ability to properly voice these concerns. I look forward to further clarifications from the Minister about how these avenues will be put in place. Presiding officer, staff safety and patient safety are inexorably linked. Right now, NHS staff are having to endure mammoth workloads to the detriment of their own well-being. In advocating and pushing for patient safety, we must not forget the importance, too, of staff safety. As I indicated at the beginning of my speech, the NHS is an integral and life-saving institution. Its value to our country cannot be understated, and it is incumbent upon us as policy makers to fight tooth and nail to preserve it. In order to do so, we must introduce real structural change. That starts with this commissioner. The introduction of that office could play a significant part in the reform that we need to see. However, only, only if it's introduced properly. This means that everyone and anyone can, with concerns or experience of patient safety, can have access to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. Um, speeches of around six minutes. I call first Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very happy to speak in this Stage 1 debate on the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. And thank you to those who have engaged with the committee and gave evidence. It is very much appreciated. I think a Patient Safety Commissioner is much needed, and I will now go on to outline why. Once considered the gold standard and billed as a simple procedure, hundreds of thousands of people have had transvaginal mesh fitted. And although many are symptom-free, for thousands, the negative side effects have been profoundly life-altering. Yet, despite the widespread negative impacts, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, founders of Scottish Mesh Survivors, were both told that they were unique, that the extreme and constant pain that they were living with had not been seen in anyone else. They believed this until they met each other. But their symptoms were not unique. As we've heard, the Patient Safety Commissioner was recommended by the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. Speaking of that review, Baroness Cumberledge said, we have never encountered anything like this. The intensity of suffering, the fact that it lasted for decades, and the sheer scale this is not a story of a few isolated incidents. No one knows the exact numbers affected, but it is thousands, tens of thousands. Despite the variety of issues covered, the review found several common themes. These patients were not listened to. When the healthcare system would not support them, they, like Elaine and Olive, turned to each other. And despite raising their concerns again and again, the problems that they faced were not acknowledged, sometimes for years. For those years, many patients lived in pain and uncertainty. And we cannot let this happen again. Transvaginal mesh, sodium, valparate in pregnancy and premodos all have something in common. Their adverse effects impact women, a group who have historically been and continue to be dismissed and patronised in medical settings. This is an experience I know and I can relate to, and I'm sure many others in the chamber can too. It's of the utmost importance that these barriers are acknowledged and are at the heart of this legislation. We clearly have some way to go, Recently, the Young Women's Movement found that young women in Scotland are not taken seriously in healthcare settings. They are often dismissed and their experiences are minimised. They are often left with no further offer of support or follow-up. Age, gender, living in rural areas, being part of an ethnic minority, being disabled, being trans, and body type and weight compounded these issues. This is why, as a committee, we have recommended that the Commissioner be given powers to undertake follow-ups to ensure that patients have been listened to and safety issues have been addressed. 
In addition, the committee has called for the principles underpinning the work of the Patient Safety Commissioner to include an explicit commitment to listening to and supported underrepresented voices. Several witnesses described an existing cluttered landscape in terms of patient safety, not only cluttered, but siloed, allowing patient safety issues to be missed to slip through the cracks. With this bill, we have an opportunity to connect these silos, with the role of the PSC acting as a golden thread, as Tess White has already alluded to. The Commissioner will have a clear responsibility for patient safety and will be in a position to join the dots and identify systemic problems. As a committee, we are dedicated to ensuring that these patients are listened to. The Commissioner would be required to establish an advisory group, 50% of which would be drawn from patients and their representatives. It's vital that these barriers to participate on such an advisory group are minimised as far as possible and we have recommended that all representatives on the advisory group be entitled to reimbursement regardless of employment status and this is especially important given the links between long-term sickness and unemployment. Travel expense calculations should also take into account the potentially higher costs that those travelling from rural or less well-connected areas may face. The English PSC is already in post and making a difference, and we can learn from her appointment. And I am pleased that the Scottish Government have agreed with the vast majority of our recommendations. Above all, the Patient Safety Commissioner must be a voice for patients, and people must finally be listened to and have backup when things go wrong. We have an opportunity here, one which experts have said could fundamentally alter the landscape of patient safety for the better. Let's get on with making this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tweed. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Emma Harper in six minutes, Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. I would also like to add my thanks to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee and especially the witnesses, campaigners and experts who have contributed to this report. As my colleague Tess White has said, we recognise the need uh, for a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland. And listening to some of the speeches that have already been said, they really resonate with what I want to say today uh, and, and the experience of a constituent. And I want to take my time here to illustrate the need by highlighting a rather harrowing case that, that I was involved with early on in my political career, which ended up dragging on for several years and as yet uh, is still to reach a resolution. Um, and I was contacted by a couple who was, who was uh, mentioned earlier on by Claire Hawkey, Fraser Morton, and her partner, June, who tragically lost their son, Lucas, in childbirth. The official report stated that he was stillborn. However, the couple uh, struggled to accept this as this was rushed through and any questions they had were shut down and went nowhere. And they were sure he had been alive right up until the point of birth and they requested a serious adverse event review. This was denied as then there was an insistence that Lucas was stillborn and therefore uh, an SAER was not needed. By the time they approached me, they had already established an anomaly in baby deaths at Cross House Hospital, statistics showing that there was an unusually high level of that kind of loss at the hospital over a number of years. I attended various meetings with them uh, when they met with hospital officials and board members, as well as Health Improvement Scotland and even the Cabinet Secretary. And it was obvious from those earlier meetings that they were being fobbed off with apparent hope that they would eventually give it up. However, what they didn't realise was the persistence of Fraser and June, and they went about reading many case reviews across the UK, eventually building up a knowledge that would be very difficult to argue against. They joined with other families with similar concerns, who incidentally had been labelled as troublemakers by some who were under scrutiny. There was even an attempt to blame some staff for the tragedy, even everything bar accepting the need for a, to review and to learn. 
Eventually, Health Improvement Scotland agreed to instigate an investigation, and at the same time, a BBC invest investigative journalist began her own scrutiny. The upshot to Deputy Presiding Officer of the investigations was that there was, there was serious flaws highlighted, not least of all that the neonatal unit at Cross House was 24 staff short and that staff at Cross House were under far too much pressure as a result. So I would say here that Fraser and June are directly responsible for the neonatal unit in Cross House being fully staffed. I would also point out that they continue to support other couples around the UK in similar circumstances, even raising money uh, for cuddle cots to help parents deal with their grief. Maybe Deputy President, the reason I tell this story is that if we were able to wind the clock back and put a patient safety commissioner in place prior to this all transpiring, perhaps this loss and other losses may have been avoided. Not least because statistics indicating a problem like increased baby deaths would hopefully, hopefully be not noticed, investigated and corrected way before it got to this stage. And having identified a problem, the Safety Commissioner would be able to monitor that hospital to ensure continued improvement. I think it's a point I, he I heard Evelyn Tweed making. What this case highlighted to me is that there seems to be no accountability, no place for patients to go where there is no self-interest in the outcome. What is highlighted to me is that it's nearly always the system that's at fault and not the healthcare professionals, who incidentally do seem to carry the can far too often. Serious adverse event reviews are measured and health boards do not want them against their, their, against their record. And they vary widely from health board to health board. That, that should not be the criteria for investigating a serious advent, uh, advent event review because, Deputy Presiding Officer, we often talk about what must be learned and changes that must be made to prevent similar things happening again. I think as, as Gillian Martin's intervention uh, to Art School Hamilton highlighted. Well, now, lessons, how can lessons be learned if the issues that cause the incident are not properly investigated and discussed without prejudice and without blame? That, to me, Deputy Presiding Officer, is why, along with many of my colleagues in the Scottish Conservatives, will be supporting this bill. A patient safety commissioner should be able to have an overview and an oversight of health boards, be able to spot potential warning signs and make impartial investigations and recommendations. But I have to say, for me, the remit of the position has to be very clearly defined by looking at cases such as the one I have highlighted, where we can ask the question, what would a commissioner have to be able to do to improve this situation? Real life, that's where the difference must be felt. My only concern is that the remit of the Commissioner becomes too wide and the real impact it could make diluted. So I would appreciate, in summing up, if the Minister could assure the Chamber what considerations are being given to make the remit of the Commissioner as tight as is needed to make them as effective as they can possibly be. After all, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is about supporting our NHS and making a patient's journey as safe as it can possibly be. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Carol Mock in around six minutes. Ms Harper. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Health Committee, I am pleased to speak in this debate on stage one of the Patient Safety Commissioner Bill. And I remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse with a current NMC registration as well. Um, as colleagues have said, the bill was introduced in response to the recommendation of the Cumberledge Review and it is in direct response to patient-led campaigns on the hormonal pregnancy test, Primodose, sodium valparate in pregnancy and transvaginal surgical mesh. And each of these products was associated with significant patient harms and injury and one of the main findings of the Cumberledge Review was that patients were not listened to. We took direct evidence at committee from Charlie Bethune and I subsequently met with Mr Bethune as he is a constituent of mine. He and his wife Leslie have championed the cause of children impacted by the anti-epilepsy medication sodium valparate due to the impact that it had on their or that it has on their adopted daughter and many others affected where the numbers across the UK are estimated to be 20,000. Again, as colleagues described, a patient safety commissioner should be created to listen to and amplify the voice for patients to drive systemic improvements in care with a focus on medicines and medical devices. And, presiding officer, the patient safety commissioner, or the P PSC, 
will be an independent champion for everyone receiving health care, working alongside the health care providers like NES and Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And the Scottish Government places high importance on the patient voice and the patient experience. And during the Stage 1 scrutiny at committee, many of the questions uh, that were related to the remit of the Scottish P PSC, uh, as the remit pro promoced, proposed here in Scotland, is wider than the Commissioner in England. And the remit of the Commissioner will include bringing together patient feedback and safety data shared by NHS boards and Healthcare Improvement Scotland to identify concerns and recommended actions. The Commissioner will also, when necessary, lead formal investigations into potential systemic safety issues, with powers to require information to be shared to make sure every investigation is fully informed. I believe the remit of the PSC is directly relevant to constituency work that I have been raising in Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. The specific areas that I think this could play a part of is a focus on cancer treatment and cancer pathways and travel reimbursement. Dumfries and Galloway is geographically in the southwest of Scotland, but it's aligned with the east of Scotland cancer network. Nowhere in DNG are services closer to Edinburgh than Glasgow. And in many cases, particularly in Stranraer and Wigdenshire, this means a 260-mile round trip for treatment. Constituents have been campaigning regarding the unnecessary travel for over 20 years now. And I know from engagement with constituents that this trip can often exacerbate already poor health, cause more anxiety and unnecessary stress. Perhaps a patient safety commissioner will help amplify the voices of my constituents to address this. Additionally, patients in DNG are means tested for reimbursement for journeys for medical appointments, which are over 30 miles, despite the fact that people living in similarly in other rural parts of Scotland are not. Other travel reimbursement schemes exist in the Highlands and Islands, for instance. And I know these issues are not overtly safety related, but considering specific issues and the evidence presented that care and compassion should also be considered is worth noting this today. So I would seek assurances from the Minister that a future Commissioner will consider issues that I've just highlighted to pursue real change. Mm -hmm. And I welcome the Minister's response, presiding officer, to the committee report that was issued this morning. In particular, I welcome that the Minister has agreed with our committee's recommendation that the wording in section 16.4c should be amended to specify that members of the proposed advisory group who represent patients must actively demonstrate a commitment to representing the voice of patients rather than simply appearing to the Patient Safety Commissioner to be representative of patients. This is really important as a recommendation as it ensures that those who are receiving care are being represented by someone who has an acute understanding of the impact of their circumstances and who is committed to improving processes moving forward. So I therefore welcome that appointments to the advisory group will be subject to oversight by the Scottish Parliament corporate body who will function as an external check on their appropriateness. It is clear that this legislation will make sure the voices of people using health services are heard and that their concerns are acted on with the creation of a champion that is independent of the NHS or government who will focus on the safety of people receiving health care in Scotland. It is vitally important that patients have a voice and, play and a place to turn to if, if they have safety concerns, and this bill will help ensure that happens. So I look forward to continued scrutiny of this bill as we move forward to stage two. And, it, and I also, you know, just hearing Brian Whittle retell the experience of Fraser and Chris House, it gives us a powerful statement of the necessary need for a patient safety commissioner. So I welcome uh, Brian Whittle's um, comments today. So in closing, presiding officer, I welcome the words of the minister also that the PSC will work collaboratively with healthcare bodies. And I also thank all of those, including the many who demonstrated great courage, who helped us get to this place today. And I too support the general principles of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Harper. And I call Carol Mochen to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan around six minutes. Ms Mochen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by apologising to fellow members, as I will not be able to remain in the Chamber for the entirety of the debate. I have been granted permission by yourself, Presiding Officer, to leave before its conclusion. Thank you for that. 
I would like to thank my colleagues on the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee for their work on this bill. I was not on the committee at this time, but I know how hard they worked. And I would also like to thank the committee clerks for their guidance. As mentioned by my colleague Paul Sweeney, Labour will be supporting the bill at stage one. We do agree with the general principles and, as such, support the establishment of a patient safety commissioner, ensuring that patients have a champion and a voice to protect their interests. For too long, patient safety has not been prioritised by the government. And we have heard in this chamber of the tragedy experienced by families who, for too long, were made to suffer in silence, and members have given us some very clear examples of that. If the Minister does truly wish to see the establishment of a Commissioner lead to real and meaningful change, she must listen to committee recommendations to ensure lived experience is heard and considered at every stage of the appointment process. Moreover, the Scottish Government must agree to Labour's calls for the Commissioner when appointed to be well resourced, my colleague mentioned this, with funding and have the power to stand up for patients' rights and advocate for the safe treatment and care they should be receiving. We want this bill to be successful, but we also want it to be meaningful. The appointment of a commissioner is the first step. There is a long way to go afterwards to deliver for patients across the country. In her response to the committee's recommendations addressing calls to define patient safety, the minister noted that she believed, and I quote, the meaning of safety is well understood by patients and the public. Presiding officer, that may well be true, but we do not know if it is well understood by the Scottish Government. Despite passing safe staffing legislation years ago, health and social care staff are still waiting for the implementation of legislation to improve conditions. We know from the trade unions such as Unison that amongst many of the issues faced are staffing levels which are dangerous to both staff and patients. If it had taken the government four years to confirm when it will implement legislation with particular focus on improving staff and patient safety, how can pe people have the confidence that it will be any different in this case? Presiding officer, patient safety cannot be improved without significant improvements to sa staff safety. They go hand in hand. Indeed, on this point, the Minister may wish to consider whether the Bill should provide clarity around the Commissioner's role in taking forward the concerns of staff that seek to raise patient safety issues. Therefore, we do need commitments that this legislation will be meaningful, meaningful and will positively impact patients. And Scottish Labour will con continue to call on existing challenges in staffing safety to be met to ensure this Bill does not fail to achieve the aims that it has set out. Furthermore, Presiding Officer, uh, as, had been as has been mentioned, we know that the Commissioner's initial remit will not include social care, and the Committee has supported that position. However, I note from the Minister's letter to the Committee that she acknowledges this requires flexibility, although I would stress the importance of considering the Committee's recommendation regarding giving the Commissioner the ability to have a role in issues that intersect and transcend health and social care. It's quite an important point that the committee raised. The new Patient Safety Commissioner will have their work cut out for them if they are to address issues linked to patient safety with the gravity they deserve. But concerns around funding levels are real and it really must not be ignored. I hope the Minister will work constructively at future stages, which I'm sure she will, to ensure this bill can be as strong as possible, because I do believe we're hearing across the chamber that is where we want to be. However, presiding officer, we cannot suggest for a moment that a patient safety commissioner alone will see significant imp improvements to patient safety. As we have seen in recent times, confidence has eroded due to, eroded due to scandals linked to patient safety, often, as we have heard, linked to women's health and MESH, and more recently, in the provision of endometriosis care. Whilst this bill is welcome, the SNP have overseen long-term decline in the running of public services, and while clinicians and staff go above and beyond for patients, confidence is not where we want it to be, and people are demanding real and tangible change. In concluding, presiding officer, this bill has our support at stage one. The bill is well-intentioned and similar to safe staffing legislation if implemented effectively and with purpose supported by the financial resources and the freedom of the Commissioner to stand up for patients' rights and advocate for safe treatment and care, then it can be successful. 
It is important now that we reserve, re reverse the trend um, that has been around and work towards delivering positive patient experiences and improved patient safety um, when we are moving forward. And I thank the, uh, uh, thank the Chamber for the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Mochan. I now call Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Around six minutes, Ms Callaghan. Mm -hmm. President Officer, I am pleased as well to speak in this debate as a member of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. And I too want to thank all those who generously gave their time to provide evidence to our committee. And thanks also to the committee clerks and to my colleagues for their hard work and commitment. And of also special thanks to Brian Whittle for speaking in his constituents' experience with such passion and compassion. The health and wellbeing of Scotland's people lies at the heart of the Scottish Government's responsibilities. And the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill is an important step, one that, ensures, one that helps ensure that good quality, accessible and patient-centric healthcare services are available to all of us. The Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review, known as the Cumberland Review, draws attention to significant challenges around health-related quality and safety and highlights major disparities in how different groups of patients and service users experience healthcare services, an imbalance that must be addressed. And we've heard a patient commissioner would act as an advocate for patients, directly representing their interests in healthcare and drawing on their feedback and experiences to enhance safety and quality of care. The bill's primary purpose is to give patients a voice, especially those patients who are least likely to be heard in our healthcare system. And despite the Scottish Government's good progress in patient safety in recent years, some patients have been let down and the consequences of not listening have been extensive and damaging. For example, we have heard today about vaginal mesh and it is still an issue many years on. And the Cumberland Review and Committee evidence highlights that women still experience a lack of understanding around their symptoms. I am sure that we can agree it is wrong and harmful that women experiencing excruciatingly chronic pain are not taken seriously. Too many women are told these are just women's issues. And I thank Carol, uh, Carol, I can't remember your surname. I thank Carol for bringing up endometriosis today also. It's an afternoon for that. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is a clear impediment to, to securing a correct diagnosis and the right support for people. Irene Oldfather from Health and Social Care at Alliance Scotland spoke for many women when she said, to say that they felt they were not being listened to is an understatement. They were banging their heads against brick walls. So I welcome the recent response from the Minister to Committee, recognising her call for the Patient Safety Commissioner's work to include an explicit commitment to listening and supporting underrepresented voices. And for agreeing with the need to follow up and work with other organisations to ensure recommendations really do bring positive change. Patient trust must be strengthened and early intervention is critical. And that's exactly what a patient safety commissioner will do. Further to this, presiding officer, the bill recognises the key role data analytics will play in effectively supporting the patient safety commissioner to amplify the voices of patients. For example, we've heard today also about sodium valproate and how it can be an essential medicine for those with epilepsy or bipolar disorder. But we're not aware of the imposed physical and neurodevelopment. But we're now aware, sorry, of the imposed physical and neurodevelopmental neurodeve risks to babies if prescribed during pregnancy, and also the trauma and guilt that was so well described by Tess White. Substantial evidence reaffirming these risks has emerged since the early 2000s. Yet, Valproate Scotland have noted there is still no exact figure on how many people in Scotland have been impacted. Only an estimation, which is around 2,000. And prevalence really must be understood or those affected suffer in silence and go unsupported. But thanks to fierce campaigning by Valproate Scotland, that specific data is now being collected. However, we should not be reliant on campaigners to bring these issues to the forefront. We must be proactive, not reactive in data collection to identify trends early and minimise harms. And it's good to the Minister's reassurance that the Commissioner will have access to the data analytics they require to implement robust, evidence-based, systematic improvements. We simply cannot afford to allow another surgical vaginal mesh or sodium valproate event to unfold. 
Today, presiding officer, we have heard much about patient experiences that highlight the need for this bill and about the importance of creating a patient safety commissioner role independent of government to champion patients' rights. We've heard the patient safety commissioner needs authority to investigate and report on patient safety matters and also the power to make recommendations to healthcare providers, professional regulatory bodies and the Scottish Government. In closing, presiding officer, this bill should matter to every Scottish citizen because any one of us may unexpectedly face a situation that goes beyond an individual complaint and appreciate a patient commissioner on our side. I stand by the bill's aims and I hope and trust that members will support the general principles today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Callaghan. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by David Torrance around six minutes. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too welcome the introduction of this bill and would like to thank all of those who gave evidence to the Health and Social Care Committee, the committee clerks and those organisations who provided briefings for today's debate. This is one of those rare occasions where we don't disagree on the issue and can have a genuine discussion on how we get the best out of this bill for patients. The committee heard a wide, ranging, a wide range of views from those who gave evidence. We heard varying opinions on how the Commissioner should respond to individual cases. When I asked her in committee, Baroness Cumberledge stated that the Commissioner needs to be able to take an overall system-wide view so they can identify trends and that there are other organisations that can support individuals. However, we also heard from Haemophilia Scotland that people don't always know where to go when they have complaints and that a culture of defensiveness in the NHS may prevent their complaints from being addressed. They made the powerful point that the infected blood inquiry has resulted in the issuing of apologies that some people have been waiting 20 years for and that there is value in the Commissioner being the first point of contact rather than the last. There was, however, largely consensus amongst those who gave evidence about the Commissioner not taking on and solving individual cases, but certainly, certainly listening to individual concerns and identifying where they form a pattern the role of the Commissioner in relation to individual cases must be clearly defined as the Bill progresses through Parliament, so that it can be clearly communicated to the public. As the Committee report states, given ongoing issues around patients feeling they are not listened to and the length of time taken for their problems to be acknowledged, raising public awareness and managing expectations in relation to the role of the Patient Safety Commissioner will be essential and the Government must plan for this accordingly. Alongside excellent communication about the role and responsibilities of the Commissioner, there must be an early focus on the building of relationships. It was stressed to the Committee that patients will need to see the Commissioner as someone who is on their side, when they may have struggled to be heard for some time. The, com the Commissioner must take a person-centred approach to complaints which recognises the individual behind the complaint. Those with lived and living experience of patient safety issues should also have a meaningful role in the recruitment process. This will be essential in establishing patient trust and confidence in the Commissioner. Consulting with people with lived experience and other stakeholders should be an ongoing process and not a one-off event. The report also calls for the Commissioner to consult stakeholders on the principles which will underpin the role and that these should include an explicit commitment to listening to and supporting underrepresented voices. The Commissioner must be keenly aware that not all complaints are treated equally and that existing inequalities will impact the experiences of patients when things do go wrong. The themes that were exa examined in the Cumber Cumberledge Review specifically affected women and its findings it found a culture of science around women's pain and discomfort, which is, often too, which is often dismissed or ignored by the very system that's meant to keep patients healthy and well. The Commissioner must take an intersectional approach. In a 2022 report by MBRRACE UK, it was revealed that in the UK, black women are 3.7 times more likely to die than white women due to complications from pregnancy. Asian women were 1.8 times more likely to die than white women, while for mixed ethnicity women, it was 1.3 times. The GMC has suggested that the Commissioner should adopt an explicit focus on addressing and mitigating healthcare inequalities. Where these have the potential to impact on patient safety, a call which I fully support. 
Turning to the relationship between NHS staff and the Commissioner, I appreciate the comments from the then Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport during her evidence session. She was clear that there should be communication between the two and that this could be clarified in the Bill. The Royal College of Nursing has welcomed this commitment and has highlighted that while there are policies and procedures in place for staff to raise concerns, they do not always feel that these concerns are heard. Given the pressure that staff are under at the moment, it will be essential to build positive relationships from the beginning so that staff are not reluctant to raise issues due to fears about punishment. Both staff and the Commissioner will share a commitment to patient safety, so we need to create an environment where they can work towards that common goal. The Commissioner will need to work cooperatively and not just be seen as wielding a big stick. As the committee report notes, the complex governance structures that are currently in place with responsibility for the safety of patient care shared among several organisations not only creates the risk of overlap and duplication of effort, but can make things confusing for patients and lead to them having to retell their stories over and over to different agencies. This is one example of how raising complaints can be traumatic for patients. More detail is clearly needed on how the Commissioner will work with other agencies and, and to ensure that there is no meaningful duplication or overlap. And I look forward to this clarification being added. While the establishment of a Commissioner will hopefully help to alleviate some of the aforementioned trauma experienced by patients who are raising complaints, the need for emotional and practical support is still clear. As we have seen from the effective blood inquiry, seeking resolution for complaints can be an extremely lengthy, drawn-out process which can reinforce trauma for patients. It needs to be made clear what support is available to patients and how they can access it while their complaints are being investigated. The appointment of a patient safety commissioner is a vital step towards the improvement of patient safety and will provide reassurance to people that where things do go wrong, their voices will be listened to and lessons will be learned. Therefore, the Scottish Greens will be supporting this bill at stage one. Thank you. And I call David Torrance to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It is well established that health is a fundamental human right and should be treated as such. While our healthcare system has faced unprecedented challenges in recent years, my view is that it is essential going forward to use this time as an opportunity to learn and do better for safety of patients and for the foundation of our healthcare system. We are faced with unique circumstances in this period of post-pandemic rebuilding to implement the necessary changes needed to put patient safety at the heart of our healthcare. I therefore very much welcome the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill, which extends to establish a Patient Safety Commissioner to ensure patients' voices are heard, amplified and carefully considered. The Bill proposes that the Patient Safety Commissioner would have two key functions to advocate systemic improvements in the safety of healthcare and to promote the importance of the views of patients and other members of the public in relation to safety of healthcare. As a member of the Health and Social Care and Sport Committee, I have had the privilege of taking verbal and written evidence from a range of stakeholders and experts across the sector whose views have been invaluable in informing the committee. In addition, we have heard from a range of patients and patient representatives, many of whom have strongly supported the establishment of a Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland and told us about the difference, differences such a role could have made in their cases. I am credibly pleased that the Committee has unanimously backed the Bill and this Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill was introduced in response to recommendations of the UK Government's commissioned Cumberledge Review. And the Committee was in fact pleased to welcome Baroness Cumberledge to our first evidence session on the Bill earlier this year. The review was established to examine how the health system responds to reports from patients and patient safety concerns related to medicines and medical devices. Our committee has heard on numerous occasions that the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill goes further than that of the corresponding legislation in England. As the Bill is currently drafted, Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland will not only have the power to make it publicly known if an organisation fails to cooperate, but goes further than that, the Commissioner would have the power to compel the organisation to act. It is reassuring to hear that the Patient Safety Commissioner for England has already made remarkable progress and if the bill is passed, I look forward to see even better results in Scotland. I want to personally thank the individuals and members of the public who have volunteered their time to speak to the committee at the evidence session. Many of them spoke of their personal experiences. I know that all of us present at the committee means we're incredibly moved by their stories. Patients need to feel safe in their hands of our medical professions, and I cannot fathom the unimaginable pain and mental distress that patients across the country and their families have faced. 
The harm that has been caused to them and their families is often avoidable. And I appreciate and recognise that many continue to fight for answers. Safety lies at the heart of delivering our health service, and it will be essential for the Commissioner to install trust and confidence in our communities and be clear and strong a voice for patients. The reason we are here today to debate this bill is thanks to the tireless work of campaigners and individuals who have been massively affected by the issue. And I am absolutely certain that future generations will benefit from a safer health care thanks to their incredible efforts. Presiding officer, we cannot talk about health care without discussing the universal and entrenched inequalities facing patients. During the committee's evidence sessions, we heard that time and time again how marginalised groups are bearing the brunt of patient safety issues and how the establishment of a patient safety commissioner could ensure that the marginalised patients' voices are heard and that concerns are picked upon and acted upon. Patient safety is incredibly gender, and experts told the committee that women and children were overwhelmingly the groups who have been affected by medicines and medical devices that have been thought to jeopardise patient safety. Women across Scotland have been let down by ingrained prejudice within the medical system, and their steps are shown that the healthcare system seems to be poor at listening to women and taking them seriously, their concerns about their health and well-being and the outcomes of the procedures they have had. Based on the evidence we have heard, it's clear that there is a requirement for a system to act in a more coherent way for the public interest, and the establishment of a patient safety commissioner is an effective mechanism in doing so. In response to a consultation, the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland set out a number of considerations, many of which I very much welcome, including the importance of a fully transparent appointment process for the commissioner, and that the role and remit can clearly explain to the general public through accessible and inclusive messaging. With this in mind, and as the bill progresses in later stages, I believe a clear focus should be on the given following points. First, the remit and scope of the Patient Safety Commissioner needs to be clarified to ensure a clear definition of roles across medical systems. And the medical system is a complex in landscape, and it's essential that the role of the Commissioner is clearly defined so that there is no overlap in current guide governance systems, and so that the patients know who they can contact for support. Second, the Commissioner needs to be independent of the government and the NHS, to have the resources to carry out this role properly. This will help restore public confidence in our healthcare system and encourage patients to come forward to report any cases of medical wrongdoing. And third, a person-centred approach is critical and necessary. Patient voices, particularly those from marginalised or underrepresented groups, need to be at the heart of the work this group is going forward. Diversity of voices is paramount to patient safety, and those with lived experiences should play a meaningful role in the process of establishing a patient safety commissioner for Scotland. Throughout this post process, I am confident that the Scottish Government will continue to work with relevant organisations to ensure an outcome, outcome that is robust and comprehensive. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'd once again like to thank those who gave evidence to the committee in the run-up to this debate, and I look forward to the bill progressing in its upcoming stages. Thank you. And I call Colin Smith to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. And can I add my thanks to the, the Health, Social Care and Sports Committee members and clerks for the work they've done on the Stage 1 report and to all those who took the time to give evidence to the committee to shape that report. It is clear from reading the evidence to the committee that there is widespread support for the establishment of a patient safety commissioner, crucially independent of government, providing that strong voice for patients championing their interests. Patient safety should be a non-negotiable aspect of our health and social care service. But as we've heard in the debate already, too often patients in Scotland do feel they've been failed. From the, the chemotherapy dosing scandal for breast cancer patients in Tayside and the, the, the pelvic mesh surgery scandal to the infected blood scandal and the tragic death of Millie Main at Glasgow's Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, due to contaminated water. It's clear that Scotland does need an independent body with the power and resources to shed light on these mistakes and, crucially, to ensure lessons are learned for the future. Too often patients feel that they're not being heard. Too often they feel they don't have the information to make the right decision about their care. Too often they don't trust the answers they are given. And too often they don't believe the system prioritises their health and that of their families. Take the example from Parkinson's UK, who highlighted in their evidence to the committee the time-critical nature of the administration of Parkinson medicines. If people with Parkinson's don't get their medication on time, even a delay of 30 minutes can seriously impact on their health. Through their Get It On Time campaign, Parkinson's UK and the wider 
Parkinson's community have been raising significant concerns about missed and late medicines in hospitals since 2006, almost two decades ago. Yet Parkinson's UK estimates that there are still around 100,000 incidents a year in Scotland in which Parkinson's medication is administered more than half an hour late in breach of clinical guidelines or is missed altogether on occasions, often with tragic consequences. As we heard in the debate with sodium valproate damage, the Parkinson's community also feel that calls from patients too often fall on deaf ears at a systematic level. In evidence to the committee, some have argued that there are already established organisations, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, the Health and Safety Executive, and initiatives such as the NHS Scotland Patient Safety Programme, and they have expressed concerns about overlapping responsibilities. Now, of course, as the committee highlights, we do need to avoid duplication, but it is also clear that the scandals we have heard were not properly addressed by the current organisations and the current systems we have in place. That is devastating for patients, but it is also devastating for clinicians and other staff, the overwhelming majority of whom go above and beyond every single day. Concerns were also raised by the, the Finance and Public Administration Committee about the increasing number of commissioners and the resource challenges this brings to the Scottish parliamentary corporate body. But, President Officer, that is not an argument against new commissioners. It is an argument which the Health, Social Care and Sports Committee rightly make to properly resource the Parliament's corporate body to support the work of the Patient Safety Commissioner and any others that may be proposed, and to properly resource the commissioners themselves. Because, President Officer, there are strong arguments for the role commissioners can play in independently scrutinising government and providing voices to people with lived experiences, not least in health. There is currently another petition before this Parliament from Dr Gordon Baird, a retired GP in my region, urging the government to establish independent advocacy in health, specifically in this case for rural areas, to ensure that health service provision there is fair and reasonable. Dr Baird has cited the successful model of Australia's rural health care commissioner. He took up the cause after his former music teacher, a woman in her 80s, with terminal cancer, had to spend nearly nine hours travelling back from Edinburgh to her home in Sandhead each time following palliative therapy, for no other reason than the historical convenience of consultants that led to Dumfries and Galloway being part of the East of Scotland Cancer Network rather than the West of Scotland Network. It means patients from the region primarily having to travel to Edinburgh. I will take a, an intervention on that one, yet. Yeah. I thank Colin Smith Harper. for giving way. It's just a really quick one. Would you agree that Dr Gordon Baird has been working on this for 20 years? Uh, Colin ab Smith. Uh, absolutely. Um, this and many other issues in our rural communities, concerns that have been brought by patients about the lack of, of services in an area have just not been tackled. And in this case, what it means is that patients from the region having to travel to Edinburgh for that specialist cancer care, not Glasgow, which is far closer for those residents in the West. The Health Board have promised, as Emma Harper highlighted, action to realign to the West of Scotland since 2006, but there has been no progress from them or government to deliver this. Since 2018, we have also seen the maternity unit at Galloway Hospital in Stranraer closed, we were told temporarily, because of a shortage of midwives. It means mums-to-be in Wigdenshire having to travel up to 90 miles to Dumfries to give birth. One of my constituents, Claire Fleming, lives in Glen Luce, 50 miles from Stranraer. Her first pregnancy was with Abby, who was sadly stillborn. Despite the tragic end to that pregnancy, Claire has had to drive herself to the hospital in Dumfries to deliver Abby. That is 60 miles away. Since then, she has had three children, Molly, Andrew and James, which is wonderful. But along with husband Richard, she has had to clock up over 7,500 miles between her home and Dumfries for maternity appointments because even before the maternity unit in Stranraer closed, services had been scaled back. Claire suffered from hyperemesis during pregnancy. It means that she had to stop on that journey to Dumfries every 15 minutes to be sick. She told me that she was aware of women in Wigdenshire who decided not to get pregnant because they were so scared of having to make that journey in a rush if they went into labour for fear they'd have to give birth in a lay-by at the side of the road. Claire herself has chosen to be sterilised because she says she couldn't face that journey again. President officer, that's not putting patient safety first. I have no doubt that had we had a, a rural health commissioner shining a light on these scandals independently holding government to account, we would have seen progress before to end these scandals before now. 
and I have no doubt that a patient safety commissioner, which is properly resourced, with the proper powers, and crucially is backed by safe st staffing levels in our hospitals, could play an important role in standing up for patients' rights and advocating for the safe treatment and care that we should all be receiving. Thank you. Thank you. And I call James Dornan, the final speaker in the open debate. My, my apologies, um, presiding officer. I get kicked out and I had to log myself back in again. Sign officer, there isn't a member across this chamber who doesn't put themselves forward to stand for election without believing that they can work to improve and protect the lives and well-being of the constituents that they represent. Health and safety of each and every one of us, every one of the people of your constituency, your city and across Scotland is above all at the heart of all the work that we do as an MSP. The NHS is, as we often reflect, one of the finest institutes in the world. The care and dedication of the staff and practitioners is second to none. And I'm always in awe at the levels of diligence shown when carrying out such complex and ch challenging care. However, it would be remiss of me not to admit that one of the more difficult parts of our job as members is dealing with complaints and concerns when it comes to the NHS. In my experience, our office has usually found the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Board to be extremely helpful when it comes to difficult issues. However, there have been and will be times when perhaps issues fall out with the remit and are left with patients frustrated and issues unresolved. I've recently been in discussion with constituents or survivors and members of groups supporting patients who were treated with transvaginal mesh, and I was completely flabbergasted and horrified by their shocking stories of discomfort, pain, and the wider impact it had on their life. This parliament has listened to many debates on this particular subject, and we as members have learned so much from the various testimonies preferred to us by the brave women who have campaigned so hard for patients to have correctional treatment where possible and for steps to be taken to support those involved. Therefore, I was delighted to see that in the launch of the Cambridge Review that this was one of the cases highlighted for the need for the introduction of the Patient Safety Commissioner. Sign officer, health care and innovation have worked hand in hand forever. However, as we move into an ever-changing world of AI and tech-led healthcare, human beings must always be at the centre of all our care provision. I was recently speaking to a type 1 diabetic patient who within a few years has gone from monitoring their sugar levels with a manual prick of the finger and using difficult mathematical calculations and insulin pens to deliver insulin to a monitor which can be scanned with a smartphone and insulin delivered through a micro pump which is attached to the patient's body. This not only ensures that the patient has more accurate and cohesive regulation of insulin in the body, it could mean a massive improvement to the life of this patient and a reduction of other difficult side effects which come with poor diabetic management. However, something which was very interesting to hear was that the technology, while transformative, is not without flaws. For example, if the Bluetooth signal from the smartphone to the pump fails, insulin will cease to be delivered, resulting in a spike in blood glucose levels. And this is a very specific example of even when medical technology is transformative, it doesn't go without its difficulties. And this, the, the, the safety officer would be a perfect place for somebody who wishes to raise an issue that could have effects for other people besides themselves, but doesn't want to seem as if they're complaining about a, a particularly good service. So hopefully the, the patient safety commissioner would be able to take that forward and see if there's something that could get done about it. And I think this is a very good step uh, in this bill. One of the key areas which I'm, I'm really pleased about is it's designed to improve communications with patients and members of the public. I saw that during the Cumberland report, the evidence that, re that recommended that a patient's lived experience should no longer be considered as anecdotal and shouldn't be downgraded as it presently is when it's weighted against scientific and evidence-based medicine. The Scottish Government has recognised public calls for the patients to have a new voice and continued engagement with the people of Scotland has confirmed that it should be a priority to fulfil the recommendations of the Cumberland Review, and this bill very clearly seeks to do so. When it comes to public safety and health, the best outcome for patients will only be achieved if there's a strong partnership working. The NHS procurement run by the NSS is a prime example of that, where clinicians and management work together to ensure that the needs of the organisation and ultimately the service users are met in the most efficient, safe 
and cost-effective way. Therefore, it's great that while the Commissioner will be independent, they will work closely with professionals such as clinicians, lawyers and advocates to ensure that a wholly rounded service is delivered to the people of Scotland. I'm confident that patient complaints are dealt with to the best of each individual health board's ability, but in such uh, organisations such as Health Improvement Scotland and others are doing all they can to ensure the safety of the people using healthcare facilities, both public and private across Scotland. However, the Scottish Government are right to take on the committee report and to follow the guidance of the Cumberland Review and the evidence which will ensure that the voices of service users aren't lost among the many others. While the Commissioner will not be advocating in individual cases of patients, it's good that there will be advocacy for safety and health across Scotland and that the voices of patients and service users are central to this. Patients will benefit greatly from streamlined advocacy and guidance when it comes to their safety and care within the healthcare system. And the overwhelming public support during the consultation period for this bill is proof that this is absolutely the right implementation to make. And therefore, I'm delighted to support the... the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland at stage one. Thank you. Thank you. We move to closing speeches and I call on Paul O'Kane. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to close this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. And can I begin by welcoming Jenny Minto uh, to her place as a minister? It is the first occasion I have been across from her in this chamber, and quite possibly in this context uh, the last, because obviously I'm speaking today as the former uh, Deputy Convener of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee. Uh, not, not, not the minister, of course, I'm referring to my own uh, move in terms of shadow roles. But I am pleased to be speaking, uh, looking back at my time in the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee and following on from a number of colleagues in that committee in speaking about this bill today um, because in the committee we scrutinised these proposals very carefully and thoughtfully and it was clear I think from all of the evidence sessions that there is a, a consensus that the Patient Safety Commissioner can play an important role in, in improving public confidence in the healthcare system and serving as a powerful advocate indeed for patients. I think, as has been articulated by my colleagues today, uh, and most notably Paul Sweeney in his opening, Scottish Labour does support the establishment of the Patient Safety Commissioner to champion the rights of patients and to defend their interests. But, as we have said, we want to see this bill be as robust as possible and go as far as it possibly can to ensure that those interests are being defended, uh, as I say, robustly. It is a positive step, of course, that the Government are implementing a key recommendation of the Cumberledge Review, because in recent years, as we've heard across the Chamber, we have witnessed too many scandals, often with fatal consequences affecting too many families. Indeed, the stark reality is that we cannot afford the cost, both the economic cost, but critically the human cost of unsafe care. Globally, it is estimated that unsafe care in health settings significantly contributes to over 3 million deaths per year, and that is clearly a very uh, sobering and significant number. Here in Scotland, the financial cost of unsafe care is estimated to be around £2 billion. So I think in this respect, the importance of legislation is self-evident. The crucial aspect, um, as I have said in my opening, uh, is that this uh, legislation is well crafted and indeed well implemented. Because I think, as we have heard today, uh, there are often pieces of well intentioned legislation which have failed to have an impact on improving patient safety uh, or indeed patient care. And we heard from my colleague Carol Mockin in her contribution about the passing of the Health and Care Staffing Act in 2019, which was hailed as a landmark piece of legislation to improve patient safety, as well as the safety of the workforce, by ensuring that safe staffing levels on wards. But four years hence, uh, since that legislation was supported across this chamber, um, we have had uh, a failure, I think, to properly implement that legislation and indeed to meet those standards. So I think everyone is keen uh, once more to raise that issue and to see progress in that space. Reflecting on today's debate, Presiding Officer, um, Alex Cole Hamilton and Colin Smith raised, I thought, quite rightly, the scandals that have um, impacted patients across the country, most notably at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, I think those um, very harrowing stories are part of the reason that we need to ensure this bill goes as far as possible. Um, Scottish Labour have advocated for uh, many uh, years 
for um, better and more robust systems to be in place in order to ensure that the voices of patients who have been victims of poor care are at the heart of any inquiries into uh, tragedies, most notably the story, of course, of Millie Main uh, and the advocacy, I think, for a Millie's Law in order to put families at the heart of those inquiries. I think we need to see the patient commissioner uh, taking a, a very strong role in that. Evelyn Tweed, I thought, spoke uh, powerfully about the importance of the barriers that are experienced, particularly by women in healthcare, and I think acknowledged that those have to be broken down. And I'm sure we would all agree that we want to see um, the breaking down of those barriers. And I think that's why the recommendations of the committee that Evelyn Tweed referenced about following up with patients, giving them a holistic support and indeed um, representing the underrepresented in this space is so vitally important. And both Brian Whittle and Emma Harper, I think, brought to the Chamber's attention the personal cost um, of the experiences that people have had across Scotland. Uh, experiencing unthinkable pain, both physical and mental, and having to live with that pain for many years in order to, to progress towards an outcome. So I thought those contributions were particularly important in helping us to really focus on what we want this uh, Patient Safety Commissioner to do. Uh, I think at the heart of this, we have to see transparency, accountability, and crucially, safety. They are the values that I think we would all want to see underpin uh, the proposal. Uh, and I think as the bill moves to stage two, it's critical that the government uh, works with members from across the chamber to iron out some of those issues that were raised uh, by the committee at stage one. And I do welcome uh, the minister in her opening saying that the government is in listening mode. I think that's really important. Uh, the issues that stood out for me from the committee's point of view um, have already, I think, been covered. But I think exploring how healthcare staff can freely, without fear of repercussion, uh, raise patient safety concerns with the Commissioner. And once again, I appreciate the Minister saying that she will uh, work with officials to see uh, what we can do in, in terms of that. For me, also providing greater clarity on the powers of the Commissioner to compel private companies who provide devices and medicines to submit evidence during investigations, you know, making sure that the Commissioner has teeth to push those companies to do that. Uh, Paul Sweeney mentioned, I think, investigations uh, into individual cases. I do think that is important and merits uh, looking at. And I think clarifying the remit of the Commissioner in relation to social care, as Paul Sweeney also mentioned, and how that would interact with the proposals for a national care service is very important because we know that there are significant issues in terms of safety and social care that came to light, of course, during the pandemic uh, uh, and, and throughout the, the period since, which do need to be addressed. And I think there is opportunity to do that in this. I will draw to a close, presiding officer, but I want to join others in thanking the committee, indeed my former colleagues in the committee, for all of their work, the clerks, those who gave evidence. Uh, and as I stated earlier in my remarks, Scottish Labour will support the bill because there is um, evidently a consensus on the need for a patient safety commissioner, recognised by all parties in this parliament. But indeed, as the bill now moves forward to its subsequent stages, it's critical that the government get it right and deliver because patients have already waited too long and they do need a champion. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I now call on Sandesh Gohani. Thank you. I want to start my remarks by stating for the record that the vast, vast majority of health interactions are safe. And I thank all NHS and social care staff for their hard work. The Scottish Conservatives support the principles of the bill to introduce a patient safety commissioner for Scotland who will promote the concerns of patients and advocate for systemic improvements in healthcare. The Scottish Conservatives want to see an NHS which is modern, efficient and local and takes a fresh approach to try and fix the issues within healthcare. And it's interesting to consider the background to this bill. Tess White reminded us that back in 2018, Baroness Cumberledge led a review into the harmful side effects of medicines and medical devices in England. The review made nine recommendations, including the appointment of a patient safety commissioner in England. In September 2020, the then Health Secretary, Jane Freeman, announced the Scottish Government's intention to produce a patient safety commissioner for Scotland, and I quote, not everyone gets the outcome they are looking for, and not everyone feels that they are being properly listened to. But from the evidence that we took, the patient safety commissioner will not be taking on individual cases. In February 2021, the English Patient Safety Commissioner was introduced into law by an amendment to the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. We've also heard from numerous members that the proposed Scottish PCS is different to the English one. The proposed Scottish Patient Safety Commissioner 
would be nominated and sponsored by and therefore accountable to this parliament, whereas the English PCS is sponsored by the Department of Health and Social Care. Furthermore, whilst the English PSC only covers medication and medical safety devices, the Scottish equivalent will cover all aspects of patient safety. Patient safety is paramount. And we need to be very careful in how we frame the duties and responsibilities of Scotland's Patient Safety Commissioner. While the PSC is accountable to Parliament, Parliament should not be micromanaging the Commissioner. And from the evidence that we heard, the PSC will indeed be independent. We should also be mindful that we're dealing with the public's money, around £650,000 per year, which Tess White was correct to raise. The spend must be justified. We need to demonstrate value for money. There are also concerns over possible duplication of efforts and how the PSC will sit within existing organisations. There is already complex regulatory scrutiny and oversight landscape for the NHS in Scotland, and the creation of another scrutiny body comes with risks of overlap, especially where functions and remit is not clearly articulated within the context of the wider landscape. Minister Minto explained that the PCS will look at trends through the healthcare system. And it is this golden thread that is vital to safety as it stops the same issues continuing to harm patients. Being a member of the health committee, it is vital we discover the interaction between the commissioner and other commissioners and key stakeholders. Again, as Minister Minto stated, this is because the Commissioner will not be undertaking investigations, but rather try to use expertise from outside. And I agree with Minister Minto that we need to foster a safe, open and learning culture within healthcare. And as our convener of the Health Committee has stated, we are all grateful to the patients who gave such powerful evidence, which Brian Whittle so eloquently repeated. Their painful experiences, they are using them to help create a system that prevents other patients and families going through the same pain. The Commissioner requires public engagement and public confidence that they are there to protect patients and will actually listen to them. Tess White told us that patients felt dismissed and that Baroness Cumberledge sought this post and was very clear in her evidence to the committee that she agreed with this bill. Alex Cole Hamilton and Brian Whittle spoke of how slow we have been in creating this post, though through evidence we have heard that listening to individuals to find the golden thread would be great for individual cases but those cases will be signposted to the appropriate other place. I agree with the Royal College of Nurses and Mr. Cole Hamilton that staff safety is paramount to patient safety. How can a nurse develop, de deliver excellent care when we ask them to fill reams of paperwork, which is duplicated? How can they be asked to cope with too many patients and constantly be under severe pressure? Carol Mock, and you were right to speak of the safe staffing legislation because there's nothing more demoralizing than constantly having rotor gaps that you need to cover. Paul Sweeney, you make excellent points about the social care aspect, but at the moment, it seems that the role of the commissioner is very large and getting on top of that before expansion is definitely required. Mr. Sweeney also questions the cost, which the Scottish Conservatives are also concerned about. But the overall cost of commissioners has been flagged by the Public Administrations Committee, and we must be mindful of achieving a balance and not diluting the post, as Brian Whittle said. Evelyn Tweed told us that women seem to be constantly dismissed and are not taken seriously in healthcare settings. 50% of the population are not getting the help they need. We must do better, and I hope the commissioner is a step in the right direction but we need to see the Scottish Government doing more for women. And as Gillian Mackay has said, ethnic minorities suffer disproportionately as well. Brian Whittle was spot on that most incidents are systemic issues. It's described as the Swiss cheese model because the holes line up, allowing the incident to occur, and the Commissioner must find these potential holes and close them. The Scottish Conservatives want this bill to succeed, so we'll support it at this stage. Going forward, we are keen to see more detail on the relationship between the Commissioner and Parliament. 
What is the appropriate scrutiny criteria? We believe the Commissioner should set the work agenda for each year along with the criteria that they feel that they should be judged against and present this to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee along with the previous year's work for scrutiny. We then want to see the Health Committee hold a debate each year on the work of the Commissioner. We have a great opportunity here to establish a force for good, accountable to Parliament and delivers value for money. Let us move ahead, but let's also carefully consider the detail. And I declare my interest as a practising NHS doctor. Thank you. And I now call on the Minister to wind up. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very grateful to all members for their extremely thoughtful contributions to what has been a very constructive and helpful debate. It is welcome that the Chamber recognises that there's more to do to ensure that patients are listened to when they have concerns about safety of healthcare and agrees that the creation of an independent patient safety commissioner is an important step that will promote the patient voice and make healthcare in Scotland safer for us all. I will, of course, carefully consider all the points raised today before stage two. The range of suggestions that have been put forward to ensure the patient safety commissioner is as effective as possible is very welcome and is doubtless testament to the commitment of the members of this parliament to the safety of their constituents and all who need to access the health care system in Scotland, irrespective of whether that health care is provided by the NHS or through another route. Clearly, some issues debated today will need to be considered further, but I'm pleased that there appears to be a general support um, for the general principles of the bill across the chamber. So if I may, I'd like to turn to some of the contributions um, that have been made. Um, Paul, thank you. Paul Kane, thank you for your, your kind words. And I really reflect on what you said about the thoughtful consideration of the committee um, under the uh, convenership of uh, Gillian Martin. Um, the evidence sessions that I watched were very, very powerful, especially um, those of um, the, the people that had been impacted by um, previous um, uh, uh, circumstances. Um, the bill, well crafted, so I thank my bill team for that. And Sandesh Galhani, I um, re echo your words about the thanks to the healthcare staff that do work um, in our NHS and also noting that Jean Freeman first introduced um, this, to, this idea to the Parliament as a result of Baroness Cummerledge. Um, there are various other points that you raised that I think I'll touch on if I have time. Um, Claire Hawhey, um, thank you. You too raised um, the, the evidence um, and the, the social care and also the unrepresented voices specifically around women as did Tess, uh, Tess White. Um, and you also emphasised, and it was a word that I've used a lot, is collaboration, the, the importance of that. Um, Paul Sweeney, um, you talked about individual cases uh, and the healthcare around that and um, offered to have further dialogue with me, which I would very much appreciate. Um, Alex Cole-Hamilton, um, I think it's um, important just to emphasise that um, the establishment of our commissioner uh, is standalone primary legislation, not, as Sandesh Gulhani mentioned, uh, uh, an, in, an add on to an, another bill. So we've given ours, um, our uh, commissioner statutory powers. We have also taken much time to listen to individuals, and that's something that patients wanted. Evelyn Tweed. Yes, of course. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Minister, for taking um, an intervention. Um, the RCN have raised a really important point about safe staffing being integral to patient safety. So in your new role, do you see that as a key uh, principle and will you be looking into it at stage two? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Tess White, for that intervention. Um, we've certainly taken, uh, I've taken the, the decision to review staffing um, uh, and the, the contribution that they can make to the commissioner, but it, it will be the commissioner that will make the decisions as to what they, they view as their prior priorities. Um, but certainly take a note of that. Um, so I was talking about Evelyn Tweed. Um, she referenced the Young Women's Movement 
um, and I attended um, their launch of the um, research that they had done on women's experiences and would like to reflect and, can, and agree with the points that um, Evelyn Tweed raised. Brian Whittle, thank you very much for bringing to the Chamber um, Fraser and June Morton's experience. Um, I was particularly uh, moved um, by his, um, his evidence and also his self selfless actions and um, the whole thing that you, you pointed on that we need to review and learn and um, move, move on positively and use their um, terrible experience, traumatic experience. Brian Whittle. Very grateful, Minister, to take an intervention. I wonder if you'd agree with me that one of the things we have to do in, in um, bringing the Commissioner uh, forward here is to ensure that staff feel empowered enough and safe enough to give evidence in these cases where they don't feel there's going to be retribution or blame. Minister. I, I thank Mr Whittle for that intervention and just um, reaffirm, as I said to his colleague Tess White, that that's something that I have responded to um, in my letter, that I think it is important that we review that side of it, uh, the staff in indications as well. Um, Emma Harper also talked about the importance of listening and amplifying patients' voices um, and along with Colin Smith uh, talked about travel um, from rural communities which I recognise representing Argyll and Butte. Um, I would um, say that I'm happy to look at this um, uh, but again it's something that the um, Patient Safety Commissioner will make decisions as to whether he or she um, reviews. Um, Carol Mochen um, talked about lived experience um, and the power to stand up for patients' rights um, and also as a first step. Um, Stephanie Callaghan, patient trust must be strengthened and to me that is the, one of the, the core um, points of this bill uh, uh, and we are proactive, not reactive. Gillian Mackay talked about building relationships um, and a person-centred approach. Uh, David Torrance also talked about trust and confidence in our communities. And James Dornan uh, again highlighted um, Baroness Cumberledge uh, lived experience uh, is not anecdotal. And again, I believe that that is um, central to what we're doing. Um, how much time have I got? Sorry. There was a scheduled eight minutes, Minister, but... Do please continue. We, we have some time. In okay, hand. that's fine. So I'd like to touch on some of, some of the points that have been raised. Um, so I, I do feel strongly that the uh, Safety Commissioner's focus must be on the safety of health care. And I'm pleased that the committee agrees with this. The Commissioner's remit covers the safety of health care, irrespective of where it is delivered. And I believe this means that there will have to be requisite scope to examine issues at the intersection of health and social care, as the committee has looked at. Um, with regard to um, underrepresented voices, which a number of members raised, um, this will be whoever, uh, who, sorry, whoever is appointed as the Patient Safety Commissioner to determine this. Um, and, but I agree that a firm commitment to underrepresented voices must sit at the heart of the role. Um, Tess White, um, again, you, you talked about women, um, and I'm very proud to be the Women's uh, Health Minister, and this is a key priority uh, of the Scottish Government, and the Women's Health Plan sets out actions designed to achieve long-term success. So I would hope um, that if it, if it is appropriate, then there would be collaboration between um, and, and overlap between, between the two areas. Um, and I agree as well that we have to get um, the resourcing right, which has been raised. It needs to be transparent and accountable. And, um, sorry. Um, we also uh, discussed a bit about individual cases, and I've, I've already offered to Paul to have a conversation with him separately. Um, and I would just um, underline the fact that it is an independent process um, that we will have to hold the Patient um, Safety Commissioner correct through Parliament and whether also um, through the committee as well. Um, Carol Mochen talked about the definition of um, patient safety and there are a number of definitions um, with regards to patient safety um, and I think whether it's the World Health Organisation or NHS England's and I would 
suggest perhaps that that is something again that the Commissioner may wish to look at. So this bill will establish an independent public advocate for patients in Scotland on the safety of health care accountable to this Parliament and thereby the people of Scotland. The patient voice will be at the heart of the Patient Safety Commissioner role. The Commissioner will be informed at all times by the views of patients when deciding what they focus on and which issues they wish to investigate. And crucially, they will be accessible to patients to hear their stories directly. People sharing their views and experiences will be key to making the role work and improving the safety of healthcare for us all. This will be a significant step forward for patient safety in Scotland and will build on the extensive suite of rights that already enable patients to give feedback. I believe that this bill is an important and positive step in making a Scotland's healthcare system more responsive to the needs of patients and the wider public. Let us work together to make this step and show the people of Scotland that we are committed to ensuring that their healthcare system is as safe as possible. As Stephanie Callaghan said, it matters to every single one of us. I call on Parliament to support the general principles of the bill. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill at stage one. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 6897 on a financial resolution for the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill. And I invite Michael Matheson to move the motion. Moved. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8894 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion and the question is that motion 8894 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. <coughs> Excuse me. I am, minded, <clears throat> I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now, and I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Extremely happy to do so, uh, President Officer. Thank you. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And there are two questions to be put. The first is that motion 8869 in the name of Jenny Minto on Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 6897 in the name of John Swinney on a financial resolution for the Patient Safety Commissioner for Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed and that concludes decision time and we will now move on to members business in the name of Fiona Hislop. <clears throat>